and y'all were awfully, awfully quiet when Pastor Evan was up here, so I'm going to pull on you a little bit, make some noise, and let me know that you're here, okay? Hey, Philip. Um, nope, I need this. Sorry, I was going to toss it to you, but I need it. All right. So, um, had a way that I was going to go tonight. I got up this morning and just heard the Lord on the inside direct me to get out my notes. My notes from uh, that I take, notes that I would take in church, notes that I would take uh, in my alone time with the Lord. And that's nothing, nothing new because I look at these frequently. Uh, so anyway, I sat uh, on my porch for, um, okay, I'm just going to say it, all day long. <laughs> And this is what I did. I spent time uh, just going through some of the things that had been spoken by the Lord uh, to me and, and to this house. And so I just want to, I know we talk about this, you guys, but uh, it is, I, I just cannot tell you the, the vast importance of not just coming and hearing, but how we hear and what we do with the word that comes forth. Amen. Amen. And uh, the things that we value, when we value what is being said, when we value what the Lord is saying to us, uh, we're not going to treat it like a common word, right? But we're going to give heed to it, and we're going to write it down, and we're going to give it our attention, because God himself is speaking to us. Amen. Brenda, it's good to see you here tonight. Amen. Um, so, uh, I do want to jump in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some words with you tonight, like I said. Some words that have come forth uh, in this house and to just remind us of some of the things that God has said. Uh, first of all, I want us to turn to Ephesians, though. Ephesians 1. And we're going to start in verse 17. And I'm sure this is a passage of scripture that many, if not all of you, are very familiar with. And so I just encourage, I'm telling you, this prayer that we would pray in Ephesians, um, and, we're, and we're going to start in verse 17, and we're going to go through chapter 2 a little bit here. But uh, we have just touched, just scratched the surface of... Um, this is what the Lord has shown me anyway. Just scratch the surface uh, because Paul is praying and, he, and he's saying, I don't cease to give thanks for you and I continue to pray for you. And I pray that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding in the knowledge of him. In the knowledge of him. How many uh, of us could stand some more understanding and wisdom in the knowledge of God? To know who he is. To know who we are in him. And so this is such a weighty word from the Lord. Um, a weighty prayer for us to keep before us. And you know, and it reminds me of Brother Hagen and someone here who knows, uh, who knows this. Um, remind me of how long he did this that he kept his bible open to this passage of scripture and he prayed it multiple 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 times a day for how many days how many months how many anybody like six months or something like that and completely uh, transformed obviously the the man who god gave the mandate to to go teach my people faith the man who was raised up from a deathbed as a, as a young boy because of him getting a hold of what the Word of God says uh, about it. And uh, so I'm just saying, extremely, extremely powerful. So we're going to start in verse 17. We're going to start in the King James. And uh, unfortunately for our guys in the sound booth or our gals in the sound booth, uh, because I have a parallel Bible, and this is just a passage of Scripture that I go from King James to Amplified to King James to Amplified. So, don't worry about it, April. <laughs> All right. 
So I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Where is the eyes of our understanding? In our heart, right? We're a spirit. God speaks to us in our spirit. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened that we may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he's put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. And so we come down uh, into chapter 2, and I want us to continue uh, to uh, reading here. I do want to make mention of this. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe? Are you a believer? We need to know. He says, I'm asking God to give you the wisdom of uh, a spirit of wisdom and revelation so you can know some things. God wants us to know some things. Amen? Amen. He wants us to know. He wants us to know and understand the hope to which we've been called. He wants us to know and understand the greatness of his inheritance. Do you know that we're his inheritance? We are God's inheritance, and he wants us to know, and he wants us to understand the greatness of his power that is to us who believe, to us who believe. Say, I'm a believer, and the greatness of his power is that which he exerted when he raised Christ Jesus from the dead. Uh, the Bible tells us that that was the greatest uh, working of God's power that has ever been uh, ever ever been released was when he raised Jesus from the dead. Now, why is that? Because when he raised Jesus from the dead, it wasn't just a physical death. He raised Jesus from a spiritual death because Jesus just got through taking the sins of the world. He just got through taking your sin and my sin into him uh, into himself on the cross. And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is what? There was a penalty uh, for sin. There was a payment that had to be paid. And the penalty for sin, it, <coughs> excuse me, for death, <coughs> a fly didn't just go in my mouth, did it? Oh, boy. Sorry about that, you guys. Boy, I felt like it. Why do I have gum in my mouth? Okay. Lord, help me get back on track here. So when God raised Jesus from the dead, he was raising him from spiritual death. And it wasn't his spiritual death because he had no sin. But he took our sin upon him. And so the greatest release of God's power when he raised Jesus from the dead is because he raised all of mankind from spiritual death. Glory to God. Glory to God. And he raised him up and he seated him in heavenly places. Far above all principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. Now, one of the things that we need to understand is we do not, we cannot get our in Christ theology, our in Christ doctrine, who we are in Christ from the Gospels. Are the Gospels uh, wonderful? Yes, they are. They give us a picture. They show us the life of Jesus. They reveal to us how he walked on the earth. But if all we see of who we are is through the Gospels, then we're missing all of what happened in redemption on the inside of us. Are you following what I'm saying? 
So we see when Jesus died, when he took our sins on the cross, uh, do you know that the people standing around did not understand that? They saw him lay his life down. They saw him spill his blood. But then we go into the Pauline epistles, the epistles that Paul wrote to the church. Uh, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, especially Ephesians. We have to get into those letters to understand what was happening in the spirit realm. Because what was happening to Jesus on the cross, there was something going on in the spirit realm And that had to do with us. That had to do with us. And we don't get that revelation. And we do not get that understanding out of the Gospels. We have to go in to these books of the Bible. So because that is the revelation that God gave Paul regarding the church. Regarding what was happening on the inside of us when Jesus was on the cross bearing our sins. Amen? All right. So let's go to chapter 2, and it says, And you have he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We were all children of wrath. We were all doomed to a life separated from God, separated from life, separated from our Creator because of our sins, all of us, before we called on the name of the Lord. All right, so verse 4, and we're going to jump over to the Amplified. But God, so rich is He in His mercy because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us. One of my most favorite passages in the Bible. Because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us, even when I was dead by my own sin and my own trespasses, he made me alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. And he gave us the very life of Christ himself. Glory to God. He gave, when he raised Jesus from the dead, when he quickened him with the life of God, that eternal Zoe, God kind of life, it says that he raised you up and he raised me up and he gave us that same kind of life. And I'm telling you, what a declaration that we need to be making in our lives that God, the same life that you imparted to Jesus when you raised him from the dead is running in my blood right now. It's running in my blood. It's running in my cells. It's, it's taking life to every part of my body. That same life that you gave Jesus is working, quickening my family. Quickening, giving life, bringing life to our relationships. Quickening, giving life to our finances. Amen. Amen. Gave us the very life of Christ himself, for it is by grace that we are saved. And he raised us up together with him, made us sit down together in the heavenly sphere, in Christ Jesus, the anointed one. And he did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace, his unmerited favor in his kindness and goodness of heart towards us in Christ Jesus. Church, I'm telling you that we just read nothing but good news. We just read nothing but victory. And, and so every single morning, it, we cannot say this enough, I just pray. I just pray that we're not sitting here and just thinking, yep, yep, I've I've heard this. I've heard Ephesians 1 and 2 a lot. Yep, I've heard this. How many times are you getting up every single morning and taking your place in the Lord Jesus Christ, seated far above principalities and power and dominion? That's where we're seated. That's where we're seated, and we're going to continue to talk it. We're going to continue to teach it. We're going to continue to preach it. Why? Why? Because we're not all doing it quite yet. Every single day. This is our place of authority and 
dominion. All right. Amen. All right. So the title of tonight's message is actually, um, what is it? Fight to win. Um, me, uh, message titles, nah, not a strong suit. But fight to win, words to fight with. Words to fight with. Let's turn to uh, 1 Timothy 4.18. Wow. I'm like the minister... Uh, <laughs> The minister who said want to develop an app that when we're turning in the Bible on our devices that you can hear pages rustling. <laughs> First Timothy 4.18 says, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight of faith. So we know that there are words, there are prophecies, and prophecy means the declaration of God's word. Prophecy is the declaration of God's word, all right? And so uh, we need to know, we need to write these down, and, and he's so faithful to bring us words that are needed for our lives and for the absolute complete victory in every situation and in every season. And there have been multiple, multiple, multiple words uh, uh, spoken, and I, I, I fear that I am just not going to really give it justice tonight because we're just going to talk uh, about a few of them. But he brings us these words, why? Because he knows what is ahead of us so that we can wage the good fight of faith, wage a good warfare, because he wants us victorious in every situation. Amen. I talked to Michelle Medina today, and um, she had gotten, it, she said that she had gotten up a, a couple of days, a um, couple of days in a row this week. And, okay, Lord, what are you saying today? Where, where is it that you want me to read, you know? What is, what is the word for today? And she just heard in her heart, Psalms 91. And, and she said, really? Well, okay, okay, well, you know, I'm not sensing any fear. Because that's what we think about Psalms 91, because God is our protector, right? Uh, she said, I'm not really sensing anything, but okay. And so she would read Psalms 91, and then she would decree it. She would say those, the promises and, and the word in Psalm 91. So this happened um, for two days, for two days. Um, well, she is at home. She's been exposed. Um, I don't know. I don't say a whole lot. But anyway, she's isolating right now, uh, but with no symptoms, but with no symptoms, but doing what they told her to do and, and everything, um, but with no symptoms. And the, and the test actually even came back negative. And uh, so I just told her, pray, praise God that she didn't reason out, she didn't reason out the word she was supposed to go to and the word that was supposed to be in her mouth. She thought that it was just to eradicate fear. But in truth, she was declaring the outcome of what she was uh, about to face. No plague, no pestilence, no destruction, no evil comes near my dwelling. And so the word of God paved the way for her to walk on it. But she obeyed. She obeyed. She followed the spirit within. So there are words he gives us to fight with and to wage a good warfare. All right. So uh, we, we talked about this a while ago, but Mark 4 and Luke 8 talk uh, about the parable of the sower. Just write that down, Mark 4 and Luke 8. And, and we know that it tells us that the sower sows the word. Now, both accounts tell us to be careful or to pay attention or to take heed not only what we are hearing, but also how we are hearing it. How we're hearing it, the posture of our heart. You know, and it talks about the, that the sower sows the word. So when we come and we, we come together and, and, and pastors are, are ministering or, or a teacher is ministering, what's happened? Sowing, sowing the word. Get what, this, what, this is what's going on. We're sowing the word, all right? We're sowing the word. Now, when, when I come in, it is my responsibility for the condition of my heart. And so the condition of my heart uh, determines the effect that that seed 
is going to have, the harvest that is going to come from that seed, right? All right. So it tells us not only to pay attention to what we're hearing, but also how we are hearing it. What value are we putting on it? How are we esteeming it? How is it being put first place in our lives? Or are we just coming, just listening, and not really doing anything with the word that was sown? So, you know, we know that in, in the parable it says that some, uh, some was um, scattered on stony ground, some, um, gosh, I, I'm, I'm going to have to read it and I don't have, have time to go there, but some f- actually fell in a good heart, some, some of the seed that was scattered, you know, it fell on hearts where, where people were burdened uh, with the cares of this world, just carrying the cares, and it choked out the word, Right? So it tells us to take heed and pay attention to the condition of our hearts and how we hear the word. How we hear it and handle, how we handle the word will completely determine the harvest in our lives. Completely. All right. <clears throat> so this is, the first, uh, this is the first word that I just want I to um, share with you. This is one probably that you haven't heard exactly like this because it was shared in staff meeting. Uh, But I can almost guarantee you that at some point during a sermon, you did hear it. We did. (laughs) We did hear it. Okay. All right. This was in October the 8th. October the 8th, 2019. And this was the word of the Lord. said, be aware of the season we're in. Know and understand the season. Humble yourself. Position yourself, be faithful, be a doer of the word, a work of God's hands at the edge of time. It's for now. Laying down pride and unforgiveness, Lord, you be Lord of all. So good. So James 1.22, there's more to it, and we're, and we're going to keep going. Uh, but I just I want to bring this up. James 1.22, it says, humble yourself, position yourself. Be faithful, be a doer of the word. In James 1.22, we know this says, be doers of the word and what? And not hearers only, deceiving your own self. So we know that there is always application to the word. Always application to the word. When we hear it and we don't do it, we actually become the agent of our own deception. That, that's what the word tells us. When we hear the word, but we don't do the word, we're deceiving our own selves. Because we hear it, and we think because we've heard it, we're good. We're good. I've heard it. We're good. But when there is no application, uh, we are aiding in our own destruction. All right? All right. Here's some more of the word uh, from, uh, from October. The seasons are changing, and with me you must go. Be humble, be ready, and let go of the things I say to let go of. Be ready, be ready. Position yourself. Be humble, be humble, be humble, be humble. Um, And and so, I don't remember if Pastor actually said it that many times or if I heard it that many times, but that's what I wrote in my notes, okay? Uh, Be ready, position yourself, be humble, be humble. So two scriptures that talk about humility. James 4, 6 says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. (laughs) God, the last thing we want, you guys, is to set ourselves up in a position to where it says God resists the proud. It just means... uh, we're going, we're going in the wrong direction when there is pride operating and functioning in our lives. And when, when, there is, when, there is, when there is pride, and, you know, pride is the root of all sin. That was, that was Satan's fall, right? Uh, he was lifted up in pride. And the Holy Spirit is so good uh, to, to touch our hearts. He's so good to, to just direct us and to say, mm, this is pride. This is pride. And you need to humble yourself. 
And, um, yeah, the thing that we want most of all in our lives is God's grace, his empowerment, what he can do. And the Bible instructs us that if, if we are operating and functioning in pride, not only are we, is God opposing that, but we are out of position to receive the very help that we need. God's grace, God's empowerment. All right? Are y'all still there? Does that make sense? So, a note here. Get under authority. If I'm ever going to get over what God has put me, what God has put under me. Now listen, get under authority. If I'm ever going to get over what God has put under me. What has God put under me? What has God put, God put under you? What's under your feet? What is under your feet? The enemy is under your feet. Principalities and powers and wickedness in high places is under your feet. Why? Because you're seated in the Lord Jesus Christ far above it all. All right? So, if I'm ever going to get over what God has put under me, then I must get under what God has placed over me. I must submit myself to him. I must submit myself to his word. And if I am opposing his word in any way, then I cannot be mistaken and deceived into thinking that I am not uh, rebelling against him. If I'm not submitting to his word, I'm not submitted to him. And if I'm not submitted to him, then I'm not receiving the grace and the empowerment to put me over the very thing that I need to be put over. Amen. And uh, thank God for his word. Thank God for his word. I don't know how many times I've gone to him and I said, Lord, why? Why did I have that reaction? Why? Why is this? Pride? Lord, I see it and I recognize it and I repent of it. And I, I think I'm just going to be bold and say, there are some with issues even in this room right now. And that is the issue. The issue is pride. The issue is the need to submit yourself to the will and the lordship of Jesus. Repent of the pride and say, I don't have to have it my way. I don't want to have it my way. I need you. I need your way. Okay. So 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So God is all about your exaltation. He's exalting you above every snare, every trap of the enemy, and every uh, adverse circumstance of your life. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you. Amen. Uh, and so the rest, the rest of that from October is uh, agreement, alignment, and assignment. Agreement, alignment, and assignment. Declutter our lives. Ask the question, is this valuable or not? If it's not valuable, get rid of it. Lay it aside. It becomes a distraction if not. There are things the Lord needs us to hear and needs us to get. And our lives are so cluttered with things of no eternal, eternal significance. Declutter. Now again, I'm taking you back. This was a word from the Lord. And this was during a staff meeting in October of this past year. Isn't God faithful? I mean, you just, just wait till you hear some of the others. So I want to read in Hebrews 12. If we can turn there, Hebrews 12. And we're talking about, is it valuable looking at our lives? Is, does this have what I'm doing, what I'm giving my attention to? Does this have eternal, eternal significance? And if it doesn't, then why am I doing it? Okay, why am I hanging on to it? Why am I spending my time on it? All right, 
So Hebrews uh, chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. Therefore then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and the sin which so readily or deftly um, and cleverly clings to us. And, and so we see here that not, not all weights, not all things that we're hanging on to is a sin. They differentiated in this verse. It, not a sin, but weighing us down and distracting us says, but let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith. So he gives us instructions here in, in, in verse 1 for us. He didn't say he was going to do it for us. And see, I think sometimes, and I, I've heard people say this, and I mean, I, I get it. Uh, you know, oh, just, just, uh, just take it away from me, Lord. Just take it away. What, whatever it is that needs to be, you know, just take it away. He instructs us to lay it down. He gives us the choice. Love gives us the choice of whether we want to follow him or not. It's our choice what we hang on to. It's our choice what we lay aside. All right? All right, November 19th, 2019. Oh, and this is a, another staff prayer. Regarding the assignment of this house, he said, perseverance is required. Perseverance is required. Boy, required. Regarding the assignment of this house. And uh, if God's called you to this house, then this word is for you. Amen? Perseverance is required for the assignment to this house and on this house. The definition, Webster says, is steadfastness in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. Perseverance. Steadfastness in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. Perseverance is required. Believing God is who he says he is, not letting go of the word of God, having what God says is ours, being who God says we are, and doing what God says we can do. Perseverance is required. And the most awesome, wonderful thing about perseverance is that it's a fruit of the Spirit. We don't even have to manufacture it. We tap into him. A fruit of the spirit, perseverance. It's not in us to quit. And if we hear the word quit and give up, we know it's the enemy talking to us. There's no quit in us. There is no quit in us. All right, December 4th, 2019. Contending, 2020, a year of contending, of bringing heaven to earth. Now, this is what I saw in my notes was December 4th, but I am pretty confident that it actually, this may, may have been a, a second or third or fourth time uh, that this was spoken uh, about 2020 and a year of contending, okay? But bringing heaven to earth, Matthew 6, 9 through 10 says, Our Father who art in heaven... Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. How many of y'all want to say it with me real bad? You just get in that groove that it just should be coming out, huh? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done in me as it is in heaven. What's it going to take for his kingdom to come and his will to be done? It's going to take humility on my part. It's going to take me coming up underneath him and his lordship and his word. Your kingdom come, your will be done uh, in, in our families, in this church, in this city, in this nation. Your kingdom come, Lord, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We're not supposed to be waiting for God's kingdom until we get to heaven. We are the ones that are to be expanding his kingdom in the earth. 
He told us to pray, your kingdom come, Lord, your will be done in earth just as it is in heaven. Do you know his will is not opposed in heaven? His will is not opposed in heaven. But just because his will and we have an enemy in the earth and just because that there is activity in the, in the heavenly sphere of, of demonic pressures does not mean that we cannot be distributors of his kingdom here. Did I not say that very good? That, 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 <laughs> there, there, there wasn't much, much uh, agreement there. That is our assignment. That is what we are called to do. I mean, seriously, and you know, and I think, uh, you know, and I'm looking forward to heaven as much as anybody. Looking forward to seeing my mom and dad and my baby brother and other people who have gone on before me. Oh, my goodness, I, I am so looking forward to it. But I am telling you, there is something on the inside of me because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us in his death, burial, and resurrection and caused us to be seated in the Lord Jesus Christ that makes me want to stand in front of Satan and spit in his eye. He is under my feet. He is under your feet. Feet. And just because we are in this world, we're in the earth, and there is an enemy at large to our souls, we have been given victory. Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave for us. And a fighting spirit, man, we've got to have a fighting spirit that stands up and says, I am who God says I am. I can have what God says I have, can have. I can do what God says I can do. He spreads a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And on that table is everything that I need for abundant life. And if I have it, then I can give it. And that's how the kingdom is expanded in the earth. And you know, like, like I said, anybody... It, Everybody's a winner in heaven. And I'm not making light of that. Glory to God that there will be a day when the enemy of our soul is locked up, never to be dealt with again. But I'll be dipped if I'm going to be a Christian that pity pats around him, scared of what he thinks he can do to me. I've stood in my house. I've stood in my bedroom. I have talked to him. You want a piece of me? Come on. Come on. Greater is he that's in me than you are. And so I know you guys. I know you're thinking, wow, get a grip. But man, we've got to have, we've got to get this determination. We've got to have this spirit of faith. We've got to act like that God is supreme and the greater one is actually on the inside of us. And nothing that the enemy can do can defeat us. All right. January 5th, 2020. So this was a message on January 5th, 2020, um, and we're going to play a clip. I've got, uh, there's just a few minutes here, but we need to hear. Uh, the title of the message was A Year of Favor. January 5th, 2020, A Year of Favor. All right? This is a year of God's favor to us. Go ahead and play it, April. Dear Lord,
Favor changes the rules. You know, most testimonies I've ever heard were simply the result of the favor of God. Favor. I had this bill and I came in and they said, hey, you, you owe nothing. I had this rental car booked and this, it was $800 and I came in. They went to accept my credit card and so we went somewhere else and they gave me an upgrade to Tahoe for $300 instead of $800. Favor. 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 My child came home. What did you do? Nothing. Nothing. You know what? This is the year of God's favor to us. This is a year of his favor. The year of his favor. January 2020. That was a word of the Lord that came to this house. That said this. And that is Luke uh, 418. You guys. Uh, where he was reading from. Luke 418. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and the free favors of God profusely abound. This was the word to this house. A year of favor. How many of you have experienced favor? Uh, does anything, does COVID change, uh, change the rules? Does COVID change what the word of the Lord spoke? Does anything that's happening, unrest in, in our nation, what we are seeing with our eyes, anything that we're seeing, uh, does it change the word of the Lord? What are we giving our attention to? What's our expectation? The Lord declared in January to this people and to this house that this is a year of favor. This ye is a year of favor. What, what are you expecting? Because favor is what we can't do. Favor changes all the rules. Favor is not anything we can earn. Favor is not something that we can manufacture. Amen? All right. January 15, 2020. Um, gosh, I really wanted to get into this a little bit, but um, I, I'm going to give you uh, the... Um, I'm going to give you the date so that you can go back and you can pull it up and listen. Aren't you thankful that we have a team who um, um, captures and stores messages that we can go back and listen to? What, what a blessing. So on January the 15th of this year, uh, it was a Wednesday night. Pastors uh, had, the, uh, had the service, and they played a message by Jensen Franklin. This was January 15th of this year. How many of you remember the message? A few of us. Uh, so you can go back and you can pull that up and you can listen to it. But it's Jensen Franklin and he's talking about the Jezebel spirit. The Jezebel spirit. And some characteristics of the Jezebel spirit. And, and he said this is the spirit, the Jezebel spirit, that is against the end time church. Man, are we the end time church or what? But these are the characteristics of a Jezebel spirit. And, and, and it's talked about in 1 Kings 16, 17, and 18. Uh, 1 Kings 19, uh, on into 2 Kings even. Uh, but here are some characteristics. Manipulation. Sexual immorality. Fear and panic. And the spirit of Jezebel is an unusual spirit of fear, of tormenting fear, not normal fear, but paralyzing fear. Number four, of great discouragement of I give up, there's no use. And number five, of depression. Can you see the spirit functioning? Where is that spirit? Under our feet. That's exactly right. And while it's waging warfare and while it is putting pressure in the heavenly sphere, it's under our feet. And we are the ones, and we're going to get to this in just a minute, and I'm going to do my best to finish. Are y'all still, are y'all tired? You sleepy? You tired of here listening? No? Okay. Um, that we have authority and dominion over and... Uh, if it's allowed to operate, it's because the church allowed for it to operate. 
Yeah. And Brother Hagan made this comment that he's not holding Richard Nixon uh, responsible for Watergate. He's holding the church responsible. Holding the church responsible. And I don't even remember what Watergate was about, but I just think it's small potatoes to what we're looking at right now. Okay? And he's holding the church responsible because what we allow to go on in the heavenly sphere with principalities and powers is what's going to be allowed. All right. Uh, move on, Mona, move on. February 23rd, 2020. Uh, and this was when John Greenwald was here, and we've actually listened to this a couple of times, if you remember. Uh, we humans sometimes get to our capacity before God is through working through us. He made that statement. I thought that was pretty good. How do we ensure that we get to those places that we do not yet see? Joshua 1, and I wanted to read that, but for time's sake, I'm not going to. Joshua 1, but we know in this account that the Lord is telling Joshua multiple times, Be strong. Be courageous. Not just once. You know, he comes to him and he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Pretty much like, all right, quit having a pity party. Put your big boy pants on. Moses is dead, but here we go. You be strong and you be courageous. All right? You be strong. You, you be courageous. And God said this over and over to Joshua. Why? Because they needed it. Because strength and courage was going to be needed for the steps they had to take to possess the land. And I'm going to say the same thing to you. Strength and courage is going to be needed for you to take the steps to possess what God says is yours. There's giants on the land and you have to deal with them. And I have to deal with them. All right? Now when God says be, and that's how he said it. You, look, be strong. Be courageous. When he says that, he's imparting that to us. All right? He's not telling us to work that up ourselves and to do it. He is imparting what he is telling us to be. And we receive it by faith. Yes, Lord, I receive that. I receive your strength. I receive your courage. And I put into action my faith. All right? Of what he says to me. All right, and then he also said in this February 23rd message, how did unbelief affect or manifest itself through the uh, Israelites? How did unbelief affect or manifest itself through the Israelites? Through murmuring and complaining. Through murmuring and complaining. And that's a telltale sign for all of us. If I'm murmuring and if I'm complaining, there is a level of unbelief about something functioning in me. And murmuring and complaining, you guys, is what kept the Israelites out of the promised land. Yeah, it is. All right. And then this, uh, I'm going to finish here. So y'all give me five more minutes. Yeah, I'm taking it whether you do or not. <clears throat> All right. Galatians 6, if we could turn there, please. Has any of these helped you? Do you feel like you've gotten some arsenal, you know, to wage the good fight of faith with? Amen. So Galatians 6, 9, and then Ephesians 6, 10 is where we're going. Galatians 6, 9, don't grow weary. So... We know sometimes we're in the, when we're in the middle of it, when we're in the thick of it, when, when we're uh, waging a fight, fighting the good fight of faith, that weariness can set in, right? Galatians 6, 9 says, And don't allow yourselves to be weary or disheartened in planting good seeds, for the season of reaping the wonderful harvest you've planted is coming. Don't let the enemy dupe us into believing that uh, what, what we're doing in, in well-doing, in, in planting the seeds, in planting the eternal seeds of God's word, all right? Don't grow weary in doing that, in letting him trick us into believing that, well, nothing is happening. That's exactly what he wants us to think, that nothing is happening. But it says, for the season of reaping the wonderful harvest you've planted is coming. Amen. And then verse 10 in the Amplified reads, So then as occasion, and this is some direction, 
So then as occasion and opportunity open up to us, let us do good to all people, not only being useful or profitable to them, but also doing what is for their spiritual good and advantage. Be mindful to be a blessing, especially to those of the household of faith, those who belong to God's family with you, the believers. All right. I thought that was um, just a good word. Be mindful to be a blessing, especially to those of the household of faith, those who God has called us to. All right. And then Ephesians 6, 10 and through 18, and we're going to read this uh, in the Passion Translation, and we're going to close with this. Um, I absolutely love how the um, Amplified Version reads verse, uh, verse 10. Be empowered through your union with him. In conclusion, but we're going to read it in the Passion. All right. Now, my beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for last. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. Put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. So principalities and authorities, I'm stopping right there. Principalities and authorities operating in rebellion, spiritual wickedness in high places, cannot function by themselves in the earth okay they can't the, every every principality every demon is in the heavenly sphere not in heaven with god but another realm of the heavenlies that's where that is where they are functioning from they have no authority to be in the earth the earth was given to man Dominion and authority was given to you, was given to me, was given to mankind. No, they cannot function apart from a man yielding to them. God cannot operate in the earth apart from a man yielding to him. All right? So, if a man must yield to the principalities of darkness, wickedness, to demons, um, sorry, lost what I was going to say here, let's see, yeah, so, so if that, if that is the way that they function, and if that is the way they operate, for man to yield himself or for a woman to yield herself to them we've got to recognize that our enemy is not people but what a great strategy of the devil to get us thinking that people are our problem and so we're fighting one another while he continues to work in the dark right so we have, to, we have to recognize this. Man is not our problem. That is not where we wage our warfare. All right? And then verse 13. Because of this, you must wear all the armor that God provides so you're protected, protected as you confront the slanderer. For you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. Amen. Put on truth as a belt to strengthen you to stand in triumph. What is truth? Oh, come on. God's word. Put on truth. God's word is truth as a belt to strengthen us to stand in triumph. Put on holiness as the protective armor that covers our heart. Stand on your feet alert. Then you'll always be ready to share the blessings of peace. In every battle, take faith as your wraparound shield, for it is able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. Embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance like a helmet to protect your thoughts from lies. 
and take the mighty razor sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God. Pray passionately in the spirit as you constantly intercede with every form of prayer at all times. Pray the blessing of God upon all his believers. So I know that's it and I'm going to wrap up and y'all can stand. Um, I know that we looked at a whole lot of, of word tonight. And I hope that you will go back. I hope you'll go back and, and uh, listen. Um, but um, you know what? The word of God is spirit and it is life. And I truly believe if, if a minister sat in the pulpit and did nothing but read the word of God, that life would be ministered. You know? But sometimes we think it's easier if, um, you know, if it comes to us in, in different ways. But he loves us so much. Amen. Lots, lots of words. I'm telling you, when I was going back and I was just being stirred and uh, all I could read. Yes, I, I am. I'm thankful for I'm thank, thankful for the correction. I'm thankful for the instruction because in direction and in uh, correction is life when we make the adjustments. So thankful, so thankful for that. But all I could see in reading these notes is the goodness of God, the kindness of God, that victory is sure when we stayed connected to Him. Amen, amen. So Father, we just love you tonight. We're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful. And we say what you say, Lord, and this is a year of favor. This is a year of favor. We thank you, Lord, for the favor of God. We've heard testimony after testimony this year of your favor, of your favor in, in our lives. That the year of the Lord where your blessing and your goodness profusely abound in our lives. So we align ourselves up, Lord, with what you said. We align ourselves up with what you say. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for a strong spirit of faith in this house and in these families. We thank you for a, for a no-quit attitude. Glory to God. We thank you, Lord, for the, for the spirit of faith that causes us to rise every morning and take our place seated in Christ Jesus far above. All principalities and powers and, and wickedness in high places. Glory to God. Exercising our authority and dominion and being an agent in the earth. Lord, that causes your kingdom to come and your will to be done just as it is in heaven. Glory to God. Glory to God. We, just, we give you honor in this house and we do declare with our own mouths that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And because you are Lord of our lives and because you are Lord of this house, this is a house of miracles. This is a house of your presence. This is a house where people come in and disease has to bow its knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. It is a house where strife and confusion and division has to bow its knee. Where lawless, lawlessness bows its knee. Glory to God. Glory to God. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. All right, we love you guys, and we will see you on Sunday.